I am Sartre Rowe, and I'm working with the Legal Services National Technology Project here, uh, doing some work from home, work remotely, and remote legal services webinars over the next 30 days. If there's particular topics that you would like to see, please feel free to email us. Um, we've got a few coming up that are announced at the end of this. Um, and all of these are free to the public, will be recorded and put on YouTube. Um, we've got Shelly Saves the Day here, um, who is a wonderful lo local creator from the Seattle area, who was also one of the um, co-creators of the Seattle YouTube Creators Day and has a great reputation of teaching people technology that is practical. So she's got a YouTube channel with over 33,000 fans, and a lot of those are tech tutorials that are very useful for what we're talking about here today. Um, we've also got with us an expert from the legal services community, Daniel Ettinger, who started the YouTube channel at Northwest Justice Project and has been doing videos there and user testing of those videos uh, with client groups. And so excited to have two wonderful experts here today. I'm going to be turning it over to Shelly now. Uh, feel free to post questions in that question box, and we will get those out um, to our panelists. All right, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and show this window. Hopefully, you're seeing some slides here. All right, so today we're going to be talking about social media, legal services, and uh, all of that good stuff. So again, if you do have questions, please ask them. I am here as a resource for you, and I definitely want to help you guys get your message out there. And I know that a lot of you are working with not a ton of resources, so that is totally okay. I'm going to go ahead and run through a few things here real quick. Let's see, how do we? I'm going to hit this play button, and hopefully we can go. Is it showing a slide still? Mm, we are at a blank white slide at this point. Okay. Interesting. Let me, how about now? Oh, there. Now, there it is. <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right, let's try this one and I'll bring this one up on the side. Okay. So just for a quick reference, because most of you probably don't know who I am. So like Sart said, my name is Shelly. I have a YouTube channel, Shelly Saves the Day, um, on that channel. Uh, there is over a million views on there and I do have a Jiffy account with over uh, 7 million views and I am now getting into TikTok and I've done a few presentations, podcasts and all that good stuff. So mainly I'm around explaining YouTube simply and making sure that you can uh, do video editing. So let's talk about why you probably aren't making content and if you want to list your own reasons, that's totally cool. Maybe some of this actually resonates with you, but there's this belief that sometimes you have to be blank and you can always fill in the blank here. Like you have to be, you know, charismatic, you have to be entertaining, you have to be whatever it is. And I, I'm here to tell you that's not always the case. And then you're, you're going to say that, hey, you don't have time to do this and it takes time away from your clients. Uh, you don't have all the lights and the cameras and all the equipment that you need. And that's definitely something that I hear a lot. Or you'll say, I don't know how to do editing or I have no idea what to do after I make a video, like where am I supposed to put it? Um, and like, or you're gonna say like, it doesn't even matter because no one's even watching this, why am I putting content out there? Or I don't even know what to make content about. So if that's you, you could do a little virtual hand raise. <laughs> but um, that's probably some of the most common excuses that I hear all the time. So I just want to flip the switch a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about why you should be making content. Okay, so maybe COVID-19 has been impacting your ability to meet with people um, who need help. Uh, maybe you're not able to meet with them virtually even over Zoom or, you know, go to webinar or any of that kind of stuff. So if they're not able to come into the office and you're not able to be in the office, this could be affecting you. And here's the thing is you can't always meet with all the people that need your help. I'm sure a lot of you, you have to sift through, you know, who can I help? Who can I take on? Who do we have to turn away? Which is probably just a really bad feeling because you want to be able to help everyone that comes to you, but you're not able to do that physically because there just isn't enough time in the day. So um, that's definitely something that can weigh on a lot of people about why then trying to make content, how does that take away from that time? 
but by creating content, you might be able to help those people who aren't in a position to call for help or to be able to come in for help. And maybe you'll actually be able to sift through and meet with the correct people because some of the people who come in have very surface level questions and you're able to create content that can answer those questions so that you can actually spend more time with the people who actually are in dire need of your help. So you'll actually be able to help more people because instead of having to repeat the same answers to your frequently asked questions over and over over again in person with them, you can actually re redirect them to a place where they're probably going to get their question answered and you don't have to spend that time face to face with them that you could spend with someone else who really does need your help. So, And this is a way to spread out education and to the public about their rights and um, anything like that, which is new, like new laws being passed or things like right now um, with COVID and you know what you're seeing maybe with rental and how that's working because some people aren't able to pay rent. What does that look like? So this is a very timely time to also make content. So um, you'll be able to help the people who need the most immediate help. And then um, you will reduce the amount of time you have to spend repeating yourself. So those are a few reasons why you should be thinking about making content. So. Okay, so what should be in your content? So a lot of people are like, I don't know where to start or where to begin, what should I do? Um, the number one thing I would say is start with what are the questions that you see most frequently and answer those in a video. Because if they're coming to you in person and asking those questions, you can definitely believe for every person that comes to you, there's a whole bunch of people online that have the same question, they just don't have the resource or the knowledge to know who to go to ask that question. So even if you started with what is the thing that I always seem to be asked about and I just recorded myself answering someone that particular question and you threw that up on a video site, that would be a good place to start. So like I said, timely content about new law changes, maybe like I said with COVID and rent and all of that stuff or you know how Governor Inslee has said that you can't necessarily evict someone right now or for the next 30 days. Stuff like that is probably a good thing to also put out. Um, questions and comments that you receive on content that you have already made, those are a great place to mine for data on what is it that people are not understanding about your current content or questions that they're currently having. So that's a really great thing there. Um, of course, in the end of any of your videos or in your description box, you probably want to put your contact information and disclaimers. I know all of you lawyers and legal places like to say, you know, this is not the same as talking to a lawyer and all, all that good stuff that you probably want to put in there, you probably want to put in there. Um, and then you would say information. This is just a statement. Information is not always necessarily entertainment. It's great if it can be, but I don't want anyone to beat themselves up over like, Yes, I'm talking about Section 8 housing and it in, in isn't sexy and it isn't like exciting, but it is very important. So that kind of information, don't beat yourself up if what you're doing is really informing people and educating them, but you're not necessarily over the top crazy antics entertaining them. So um, evergreen topics that don't change a lot. Um, for instance, something like a protected class usually is not going to come by tomorrow and be like, this isn't a thing anymore. Um, and if you did, that would be a different video to make. So something like that, that's relatively safe. If you're looking for a topic that isn't as timely, that could be a topic to go after as well. And then maybe if you're in a particular state or region or country where certain things are um, illegal or wanted to be addressed, you might wanna be talking about something that is maybe um, particular to your area, of course, with all your caveats and disclaimers that it doesn't apply to everyone. And then maybe, Something else would be, what kind of event qualifies someone to seek the kind of help that you provide? And um, if anyone has any questions, like I said, please let me know, but I'm assuming that there are not, so we're just gonna move on. And the last thing I'm gonna say about what should also be in content, um, one thing that I would highly encourage just for inclusivity and everything like that is going to be uh, um, closed captions, whether those are burned into the screen. Um, and there are a couple of great services out there that can do that, especially like uh, mixed captions where you purchase blocks of time and um, that's a really good option or actually writing out transcriptions and including them in YouTube so that people can listen without the volume on and still be able to understand what it is that you're speaking about. And there are also services like rev.com which will transcribe it for you at the cost of a dollar a minute. All right, so now maybe you've created some content and now you're gonna say, where the heck do I put it? So 
here are just a few of the places where you can put your content. So YouTube videos, one of the great things now recently, um, you can now do vertical videos and it will take up the entire screen and won't put those black bars on the side, which is awesome. And of course you can do widescreen as well. So why vertical video is actually really a, um, kind of a cool area to be in right now. There are studies that are gonna show that like 80% of the time, even when people are on video sites, they're still holding their phone in a landscape or up and down, sorry, portrait up and down orientation. So if yours is vertical, it will take up the screen. They'll see all the information that you have. And then the nice thing is if you're already creating vertical content for sites like TikTok or Snapchat or anything like that, you can actually just download all those videos, stitch them together in a program and then put them up on YouTube or someplace else. And you don't have to do any editing, which is really, really nice. So um, almost all the sites now also accept vertical video. So that's going to be Facebook, um, Instagram, and of course, like IGTV. So there's a lot of benefits to not having to change um, and, and do a whole bunch of editing for content that you've already created that is in um, a vertical format. A quick question here. What, what is IGTV? Yeah. What is IGTV? So it's a separate part of Instagram where it's going to be videos that are over a minute can be put there. and the nice thing about IGTV is you can also create like a series if you wanted to do a whole thing about, let's say, those protected classes and you had one video about each one of them, you could create an entire series around that. And anyone who has an Instagram account does have an IGTV account as well. You can put videos up there up to 60 minutes if you wanted to. You can upload them from your computer or from your cell phone. But it's just another way for you to yeah, put your content out there. Eventually, I've heard that they're going to be um, monetizing IGTV just like they do um, YouTube, but it's kind of an area where a lot of people haven't really gotten into yet. So it could be an area too where, um, especially for legal services or something, you would be one of the few and far in there. Does that answer that question? Yes, definitely. Oh, okay, cool. Feel free to stop me. I'll just keep rolling on. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna talk about how do you make content? Um, so some of the free resources that you can pick up, um, Canva, PicMonkey, um, so not Photoshop, that one is paid, but um, GIMP, which will open Photoshop files, and that one is free. Adobe Spark is free. PixArt, um, that one is also free. And then of course, um, like Pexels and different things where you can find uh, royalty-free, uh, photos that you can just like um, stock photos that you can use and put in any of your um, projects you can also um, there there are several sites but pexels is one of them so almost all the sites are going to have free templates and default sizes for platforms and um, that can be really helpful if you wanted to do something like you have let's say a widescreen video but you wanted to throw it inside of a box that was square or something if you wanted to throw that into your um, instagram feed you could do that and have a background that had like maybe your phone number and like the website name or something like that that way you don't have to completely edit your widescreen video and you could still put it inside of a box that will fit inside of instagram and have additional information on it so that's kind of a a hack on ways that you don't have to edit as much. And then, so you can also throw your video. I have one up on my YouTube channel, but you can take your widescreen video and throw it into even a slide. Like I'm in um, Keynote right now. You can do the same inside of uh, PowerPoint where you can put your video inside of like a basically slide and export it as a video. And then you can use that video on Instagram or wherever else you wanna put your video. And that's a great way too if you wanted to decorate your background and put your information about um, your company, your website, and uh, how to contact you. So that's kind of a good thing. And then I would say um, carousel posts for Instagram. I'm going to show you example here of um, Daniel. You may see some of your <laughs> your content in my example, but it could just be a really easy way. If you guys are already making content, I saw there were some screen recordings, some slideshow presentations that were already videos. Um, I just want to kind of show you how you can take some of the existing videos that you have and create micro content around it so you don't have to necessarily create more. You can just create more from what you've already created. I hope that makes sense. So um, like I said, you can record yourself with your cell phone answering commonly asked questions and you can do like animated whiteboard videos or cartoon videos for people who are um, a little bit more shy about their camera presence or don't know how to um, be on camera um, naturally or just don't want to be and put their face out there, um, those are also options that you can do. And there are a couple of resources just letting you know there's like a, a company called Doodly and for the cartoon one, there's their sister company called Toonly that will do those kinds of videos for you. So 
I'm going to show you an example really quick. So this was actually from a YouTube video, Northwest Justice Project. And so this is just an example. So um, they were talking about um, rent disputes and, and how to work with your landlord. So what you could do is, let's say, because um, obviously this was some sort of like slide or um, video animation, you could take screen captures or export those slides and then actually turn them into like a step-by-step -step of, what to do if you're in this particular situation and who you'd want to contact or how long you need to wait. So this kind of information is really simple because it's sequential to throw into um, multiple items like in a Instagram carousel post. And that would be an example of something that you could put up from your video that you've already created. So, so another, Shelley, ex yeah. Th that, <laughs> those slides, I actually did make that in Keynote. Yeah, did you? But it could have <laughs> been PowerPoint. It. It could yeah, have been. so those yeah, are just hand-drawn uh, on a whiteboard. Then I took an image of it, put it in a keynote slide, and yep. all of those slides became the video. Yeah, I thought it was great. I thought it was awesome. So but I was that's like, a good point. We could that. bring it back, mm -hmm. you know, into a slide form and put that on Instagram. Yeah, or for sure. All right, so here's another one. We had this webinar that was for this unemployment law project. So information that came in here, when you look at this and you see one hour and two minutes, it's awesome that you guys um, were able to record this. But if I am someone probably looking at this video, I'm probably intimidated by the the size of, uh, or the length of this video. And maybe I'm like, what? A, maybe I just need this one particular thing. So you can always go in there and you could put timestamps, but additional ways that you could do this is from this, um, particular webinar, you could take out a few important things if there were like the slides or whatnot, you could throw them into like an Instagram um, post, you can throw them into a Pinterest pin with a link that comes back to your video. So if someone was on Pinterest and actually looking about unemployment benefits, um, they can actually then be sent and redirected back to this video. So um, if you don't know how to do that, um, definitely you can always shoot me a, a question, but or there's lots of YouTube videos about how to do it, but basically you just save the URL from your video. Once you create your pin from either a slide or whatever it is, you just link that URL to that pin on um, on Pinterest. So just, some other things. Yeah, oh, sorry. Um, those, those webinars that they put together very quickly um, had over a thousand attendees. Um, and the uh, analytics in looking at these things when we've transferred them over to YouTube for the last few years, um, people do tend to fall off somewhere between the five and the 20 minute range. If you can chop those videos into one discrete topic um, per video and turn them into multiple YouTube videos, um, the uh, count goes up and the attention, um, you also tend to get more um, feedback or comments on those by chopping them up. So great format for an hour long webinar, uh, but I would recommend chopping that stuff up to get it into YouTube. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's actually what we're gonna talk about here. So we're saying, if there are individual questions that are being asked and answered, try to create individual videos of just that answer and question. You can post it as part of a series. You can post it as part of a series on IGTV. Um, you can break them up into individual videos labeled that on YouTube. So you would result in 10 six minute videos, each with a specific topic and answer rather than one 60 minute video. Hopefully that makes sense. And that's kind of what Sart was talking about is if you can break it up and have it be specific to one particular topic, I think you would find that more people would watch that particular thing that pertains to them. So absolutely. And then here is just another example. So I went on and said, Seattle has these protected classes. So we're saying, uh, what could I do with this information? So this, I, I consider more of an evergreen content list. Like I said, it's not really gonna be changing. So you could do something like the Instagram carousel post about each one of those particular things as an example. You could have a 60 sec, up to 60 second TikTok video explaining any one of them or any two or each one of them separately, if you wanted to put that on there. Um, you could have, you know, a video explaining that on your Instagram feed. You create a Pinterest graphic, one for each protected class and information about it or whatever. You could create a YouTube video. It, I was just putting 90 seconds. It doesn't have to be any particular length. You could have um, videos and put them on LinkedIn or Facebook, and you could have individual videos about each or one video quickly going over all of them. So the idea is once you create something once, you can distribute it everywhere and reuse it as many times as you need to. And so I just have two more quick examples and then we're done. 
So anything from like a news article or a closed case that recently happened, if you're looking for ideas, you could still create a commentary video about why a decision was made a certain way or explaining what it actually means when a decision comes out. Um, you could explain why someone, um, what someone could do if they were in a similar situation, like who they might contact or steps they might take. And you could explain some of the rights that might have been violated or how to report activity if they're in a situation that is similar. So even if you aren't creating any of the content, you can create content as a reaction to information and news that you see other people doing. And then last example is just, so this was on the Northwest Justice Project page. And I'm just taking an example here as um, they had this on their YouTube and you can, like I said, run through slides or whatever else. And then you could take that same image, graphic, whatever it is, and you could just resize it and then put it on each of the different platforms. And it's still the same information, but it's sized to what the platform actually prefers. So like I said, Instagram is sometimes that square. Um, Pinterest is usually better with like a longer pin and then IGTV is usually that vertical video format. So don't freak out if you have to think about putting it on multiple sites, you can really still do that with the same one piece of information. You can do it in Keynote, you can do it in Final Cut Pro or iMovie, any of the different places. So it's really just coming back to once again, create it once and distribute it everywhere because you probably don't care where people are consuming this content. The important thing is the information is getting to them when they need it. So if you have questions, I'm happy to um, talk about that, but that's everything in the slides. So we definitely have two questions here um, that have come to me directly. One of them is, um, if, if you were just gonna start with one or two of um, the platforms that you mentioned, where would you really recommend? Um, YouTube and... Um, might even think um, about doing Instagram because a lot of Instagram is targeted in, into particular areas or hashtags. So um, I, I would probably go with those two. Okay. Um, and the second one is um, if, if you're starting a new account, um, how do you get those things noticed? Because I mean, obviously there's a lot of accounts out there, but what are what's a tip or two that you have for helping that new account get noticed? Um, okay. So the thumbnail is probably which is the beginning image that you see when you're browsing through youtube um, that is basically the invitation to your party and even if you have the most amazing information and the most amazing house party if you dress it up in a house that looks like it's about to be demolished um, no one's going to come to your party so i would say spend a little bit of time trying to create a thumbnail that is evocative of what is actually in the video um, but actually interesting in some way so some hints for that are going to be um, avoid like really tiny scripts um, like with with your fonts um, think like childlike big block letters um, usually big ones that are really easy to read that's probably going to be easier if you're going to put any font at all try not to put more than um, four or five words don't let those words be like more than six letters because each time you do that, it just takes up a lot of room on the screen. And then the other thing that um, pairs with that is going to be what is the title of the video? So why should someone care about that video? So naming it like Northwest Justice League webinar presentation, January 2020 housing crisis. Great for you in your file archive formatting stuff. Awful for anyone trying to search for, you know, can I stop paying my rent without being evicted? So think of um, how you would craft that title and how it, it would be searched by the person finding that video, so. Awesome. Um, an another question here is, um, is it worth doing some um, paid advertising um, no. to direct people towards that? No. Okay, and I could, a little bit on, uh, just haven't seen any return on investment or what? Well, here's the thing is, if you had something to sell, um, you were selling a webinar, uh, you were selling um, some sort of coaching service, you were selling a product where you were gonna be making all that money back, um, then maybe, but if if it's for educational purposes just to get your message out there, no, because you could spend that money actually on, on things that would be better, so no. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, there was a question about, about the slides, um, and we will uh, make slides available with the blog post afterwards and send out the email to those. Um, uh, one yeah, more here. Free. Help yourself. I stole them all from, I think, Daniel probably. <laughs> <laughs> from your <Excellent>. YouTube, <laughs> your website. I stole them all. 
I probably shouldn't admit that to lawyers. <laughs> it, I think it's fair use. But sorry, you're the copyright expert. <laughs> yes, and I, I, I believe we even have those under a Creative Commons license. Want, oh, do want you? those to be shared okay. widely. I saw all of them. <laughs> Non-commercials, fine. Yep, yep. Okay, well, um, we're turning it over to um, Daniel here uh, for the next part of the presentation. Please continue to ask questions, and we will continue to knock those out. Um, wonderful, amazing advice there, Shelley. Okay, so just let me know when you're viewing my bio and face again. Um, not yet. Not yet. Um, just saying. Uh, let's try that again. Okay. Um, okay, I just hit the show my excellent. screen button. Yes, yes. we're now seeing I'm your screen. Going. Okay, so um, I just kind of made a brief outline over here on the right hand side of like things that I can talk about and I can just march through them. I can stop and linger if you want. Um, of course, mm -hmm. keep asking questions. So first off, this is me again. I Googled myself to try to find a bio and picture. And this is from two years ago at the LSC Innovation and Technology Conference. And I look exactly the same. So that, that's, that works. Um, this is where I work at the Northwest Justice Project. It's the primary civil legal aid provider and LSC recipient in Washington state, all across the whole state. We have about, I think, 18 offices now. And um, we have maybe 180 attorneys, I wanna say, but we also operate a website called Washington Law Help. It's the statewide information and free legal forms uh, website. Here it is. Washington Law Help has about a thousand different publications in various languages. I think we have 1.5 million visitors every year, 4 million page views, something like that. I think that's the last thing I heard a couple months ago. We've been just churning out new resources uh, every day having to do with the coronavirus COVID-19 crisis and all, and this entire section, you know, wasn't here in February. Um, and so there's two attorneys. I'm one of them who are what we call content editors. And we we create these publications. So the governor issued a moratorium on evictions. And, you know, you might think, well, that means all evictions are going to stop. Actually, no, it's certainly more complicated than that. So how do we get that into plain language? And over here, I guess I just, the three things we try to aim for is accessibility, accuracy, and effectiveness. So accessibility is everything from plain language to, you know, reaching people who are limited English proficient to, uh, to other languages, um, visual impairments. We try to reach everybody in Washington, all, all of our client communities. And of course, it's got to be accurate. It can't be just like, oh, maybe, you know, and as things change, I think that's the that's the biggest challenge right now is the law is changing almost daily or hourly and how, how it affects our clients. And we're seeing how things are. Um, I, I think we get a request for a new publication almost every couple hours and we try to keep up and we try to make sample letters that you can give to your landlord and it's got to be effective, too. So, you know, if people if we aren't reaching people, then of course what's the point but like so as the, as an example this eviction moratorium which was just extended and expanded so we had to like take down our our original publication that we had up in march and just redo it um but yeah like it's it's changing so much that like uh, video is a natural fit so now we had some attorneys who I said, well, would you be willing to talk and just answer some of the frequently asked questions that we're getting like through our Facebook messenger and uh, you know, just that our, our attorneys are hearing in the community. Um, and these, and some attorneys, you know, they're a little reluctant to have their face on, on the internet, which for various reasons makes sense, but you know, some people are fine with it. So a workaround was like, okay, well, can I just record a phone call with you, a Skype call, and then I'll I'll make that into a video, and that's what I did. I mean, I can, you know, Shelly, I I take a note about the thumbnail. I think this is not like the best best possible thumbnail, but it's like, you know, we got to cram all those logos on there. Um, but we did use the time code 
thing here. So this is a 15 minute long video, but yeah, nobody's gonna sit around for 15 minutes or few people will, I shall say. Um, but like, these are the frequently asked questions and you know, this skips ahead to that particular, what if the landlord wants to enter your apartment, but we're supposed to be socially distancing. And now I'm gonna scroll through, you can see all I did is take like a sort of plain language summary of what the attorney was saying and put text on the screen. Okay, not the greatest type of video, but like in a quick, like to, to turn things around rapidly, that's what we did. And in fact, we're gonna redo this one tomorrow. Um, and this is basically, uh, it could be a PowerPoint, but I, I made this in Camtasia. So I'll talk about that in a little bit uh, more. Um, I'm just going to kind of give a brief tour of various things and we can like stop and linger if you want. This is our YouTube channel. We do have playlists. We do need to, we still need to get an intro video up here that I haven't done. Um, we started these coronavirus community conversation videos and made a new playlist. Um, you'll recognize some of these shapes. These are from our landlord tenant video series. And we have videos in ASL. We sometimes share videos from other organizations. And I, I will say that like, we certainly could be doing more with engaging with our community through YouTube. Um, now the, we, we, I think historically we've what been using YouTube. What do you mean by engaging with your community? What's that? S sorry, sorry. What do you mean by engaging with your community? I think what I mean is, if people leave a comment, like responding to it, like Shelley was saying, and then creating a new video based on that. But I think, you know, a lot of people aren't finding these videos through YouTube. I, just for the Northwest Justice Project, I shall say. They, they find them through Washington Law Help because we link to them. And that, that's where they get most of the, we can tell from analytics, that's where they're being watched is on this site. And it's, I, I want to expand the use of the actual YouTube channel itself um, in the future. Um, I just want to get a little bit more into the editing and the, the, the tools that I use just so we can talk about those more too. We do have a Vimeo page too. Um, we use this more internally to share like trainings because Vimeo lets you put a video behind a password. And Sometimes we don't want to share a video publicly. We just want to have an internal training video and we use it for, for that. Um, now, a couple of years ago, I, I, we received a technology initiative grant, an LSC initiative grant to actually do user testing, do field testing, because we hadn't really done any of that before. Um, now, I know comments are a form of field testing, but actually we went out to senior centers, went out to the farm worker community where people lived, showed a video, and then asked them, what did they think? Asked them, what does this work? Would you, would you share this with a friend? Is it annoying? Is it offensive? Do you like these cartoon people? You know, because over the years, we, we were getting anecdotal feedback from other attorneys that like, we were making light of a serious topic by using these cartoon people. But most of the, the um, field testing feedback we got was no, actually those, those are great. People liked that. And so I'm just showing you here a little guidebook that I made um, about the field testing process and it's available on LSN TAP's website. These two resources here, Reaching Your Readers, which is from British Columbia, and this one, Focus Groups, A Practical Guide for Applied Research. I think if you've never done field testing and want to, want to know where to start, I would get these two resources and read them. But if you want to read just a summary, you can get this 10-page guidebook here that's on the LSN TAP website. And you'll recognize some of these characters. These are from our videos. I mean, this is just drawn on a whiteboard. So we've got we've got two questions here for you, Daniel. Um, first one is, um, what was what is the process for like getting these videos vetted, approved? Is this uh, initiated by attorneys? Is it communication staff? Um, how how do you really get that through the uh, organization, and how does that come about? Um, I would say <laughs> over the years, every which way. I mean, I have worked on 
all of these videos here, except for this one right here, is somebody else's. I, I mean, I made at the either at the request of an attorney or a supervisor, or through a grant where we were re we were tasked with making videos that reached the ASL community, and we don't have a communications department or director at Northwest Justice Project currently, um, but you know. As a, as a matter of course, it's one of those things like, okay, when, when the law changed about source of income discrimination, meaning landlords are no longer allowed to say, we don't take Section 8 vouchers. Okay, now that law changed in, I think, 2018. So it went into effect at the end of the summer, and we wanted to get the word out. So one of our uh, um, housing experts said, we got to get a video out. So that was like, okay, let's do that. So that's where this, this video here came from. Um, I can I can talk a little bit more about that if you want, or I can get into the more of the the tools. Which which direction do you think we should go, Sart? Um, uh, let's go for the tools, and then um, we'll we've got some follow ups here. And to let people know, a bunch of people have been asking for that guide. I'm dropping that into um, the answer for all here um, and i'll put it into the chat a direct link to that guide um, and a short video um, that or video presentation daniel did talking about that guide yeah so, yep. and on this website i noticed if you hit pdf it gives you a pdf of this intro screen rather you got to go down here to get the actual guide um so just hot tip on that um I, I was going to just show you Camtasia. This is Camtasia. It's a video editing and screen recording software. Um, so I have a, you know, we have a few computers at NGP with a license for this. I'm scrolling through a, a video I recently made, and I'm going to tell you kind of how, I, like, quickly. This is a combination of programs, but I, I used to use just iMovie for everything, and I think that's sufficient except it doesn't have the video screen recording that I that I want to use. And I'll, I'll tell you why I want that in various ways. So because sometimes I want to show a website like here. And I want to like, so I record the website, you know, we're sh and um, these animations were not drawn by me. They are provided through this other subscription program called Videoscribe. And they have lots of templates like they do a lot of like you know faux whiteboard explaining so and it looks like they've got a lot of new coronavirus templates um but i actually did you know i'd make i i liked how these animations were but i, I kind of wanted to mess with them a little bit more so i i used their graphics and then i did some recording of them and then I could I could you customize them a little bit more. Um, now a lot of when we were like back in 2011, we were inspired to make uh, very simple videos that were kind of based on like common crafts ideas. And if you've ever seen these, <clears throat> the original videos were like the just somebody's hand moving pieces of paper around on a whiteboard. And they're very good explanatory videos. And like Common Craft has gotten more into the actual like education about how to educate or explain in short animated videos. So I recommend checking these out. Uh, they also have like how to how to make these and how to explain things simply. So that's a good place to look there. Um, but one thing I learned from Common Craft and that I've been doing a lot is use Camtasia, but to record, now I'm showing you this. This is a PowerPoint where I made my outline today. And PowerPoint and Keynote have a lot of animations built in. So like the fly in or the fade. And see that? I don't like how it's coming from the bottom, so how about let's have it come from the left. There you go. Now, if I recorded that, I could go into Camtasia and kind of use those animations, and I wouldn't have to like do how I used to do is like actually move things around on a PowerPoint slide and repeat the slide over and over and like have 
six slides per second, kind of like very old school stop motion animation, but that's another way you can do it too, but it's just less time consuming. So I, I guess I want to use this opportunity to show like, you know, when the law changes very rapidly, like for example, the public charge rule change like was going to go into effect and I can explain more about what that is, but just, just assume that like a, a rule was going to go into effect that was going to affect a lot of people, but not as many people as the community thought. So we had to clear up that misconception. So it was going to go into effect. Then there was a court case and an injunction where it stopped. So we had to change our video. And then we, in, in January, the Supreme Court made a decision that let the rule go into effect. So that's over the course of months. And it affected, we had about eight or nine videos in various languages in Vietnamese and Somali and Tigrinya. And it, it was going to, and to, to, to actually make that change, I was taking up a lot of my time. So it's what, uh, as a counterexample of how video can be used, I just want to like go over to uh, what I think is a successful use of Facebook Live. And that's Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, which is an organization here in like they have a main office here in Seattle, just like the Northwest Justice Project. And the same day that I was trying to change all those videos by myself, they did a Facebook Live Q&A and reached a couple thousand people and they did it in English and Spanish. And I think that's a really effective way of using video and, and they didn't have to change all these animations and do all that. So it's just a counter example. I mean, we've been sharing our videos on our Facebook page, the Northwest Justice Project too. And definitely when we share a video, I, it, the, we get more views and more activity on that on that post. Um, so I wanted to talk about, now I think like Shelly covered Instagram and TikTok and promotion quite a bit. So I, and, and actually that's kind of one of those things I was learning a lot from her portion of the presentation. So I don't need to go into that, I don't think. Um, this is something we're just now getting into is transcription. I'll talk about this. And I've been looking at various services and I actually kind of want to ask everybody on this presentation if they've ever tried any of these and which one they like, because I think I'm leaning towards getting this. I haven't even tried it yet, but it's called Descript. And there's a couple other ones that I've been looking at, Trent and Simon Says, and Shelly, you mentioned one that I can't remember, but I'm gonna go back and look at it. But these are AI automatic transcription services. And I, the reason I want this is because when we make a video like that community conversation, I want to be able to quickly generate a transcript, not typing it out, stop, start, like I've been doing for years, like since back in the VHS days. Um, but then I want that transcript so I can turn it into a print publication for people who want it on Washington Law Help. And then I want it translated. We can send it to the translator and get it, get it translated quickly, that FAQ kind of um, video. So if anybody knows anything about that, I'd love to hear more about it. And the last note I will say about, and you'll read this if you read that guide, how to make and test videos uh, as sort of like a counterexample to that Facebook Live Northwest Immigrant Rights video. The reason we do videos with animation sometimes is for the translation piece. It is so to accept for the accessibility for people with other languages because again, we don't have to change the video. We can just record a new voiceover. Um, and and change the on-screen text, but it's not, you know, we don't necessarily have to have like the narrator speak on camera. So in some ways that's like a a time and money budgeting concern, which is why we do the animation. But on the other hand, it cuts both ways because like I said, it's like if you've got like eight different languages and the, the law is changing so rapidly, that Facebook Live might be the way to go. It just depends on what what the situation is. Um, so, so I yeah, did drop ahead. a link to Rev um, into the chat, um, which is the one that um, Shelley mentioned. Um, and if anybody else has other suggestions on the transcription side, um, definitely um, would love to hear that. 
Um, and any other tips um, for producing in multiple languages was uh, another question that came up. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I like, this is one of like, we're really trying to, we're, we're struggling to figure this out, honestly. I mean, and especially right now, because I, I think like that example that I just showed you, like this, I like, this is the Spanish version of this video. So I have like eight different Camtasia files open or projects. And on this particular issue, I think we, you know, it, the, the solution probably was to find people who would speak on camera and do a Facebook Live. And I think like our farm worker unit, um, has to make resources in Spanish. That's the Northwest Justice Project Farm Worker Unit. And they are um, like, they're making videos and they, they're doing a combination um, and it's loading really slowly, sorry. Um, but they made these using Video Scribe and they're just sort of, and you can see the combination of photograph, photography and animation, but they are also doing Facebook live videos and they're using infographics here. So they're using, I think, I think Alex is using Canva to make these really quickly. Canva is a place to create infographic type and like bulletins like this. And they have a lot of templates. Um, I, I think that for, for making resources in other languages, I think this is a, a community it has to be a community response, which means asking people in the community. I mean, when we did field testing, that was where we discovered that like WhatsApp was the way to share information with that particular community. So I think when you're talking about other languages, it there is no one one solution. Um, and so, so we did get some tips from the community on the transcription. Um, somebody mentioned Philips Live. Um, it's live speech um, is their tool. It's a free transcription and they have the um, ability for you to send it to a human for review. Um, and apparently it's pretty cost effective. Um, the auto generated AI is pretty good at um, pulling out multiple voices in a conversation, which the YouTube um, transcription is not. Um, but the human review is apparently very fast and affordable. Um, I don't have exact numbers on that. I also dropped a link to Canva in there. And, and I think what we're looking for specifically is um, transcription for other languages too, because we've, th like the one that we're looking at for English, Descript, as far as I can tell, does not do other languages. I could be wrong, but it, this other one, Trent, it claims to be able to do 30 different languages, but it's it's much more expensive. So of course we're looking for Spanish, but also other languages. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a question here uh, for both the panelists over um, Facebook uh, Live. Like um, why would you use that? What are some tips for using it as opposed to just posting a video on Facebook? Shelly, do you wanna, I mean, do you have experience <laughs> with Facebook Live videos? <laughs> So I would say um, one of the benefits of doing Facebook Live or YouTube Live, anything um, Instagram Live, is going to be the interactivity um, and the ability to react real time with people who are asking questions in your audience. The other thing is for people who are not tech savvy and are not knowing that they don't want to delay anything with editing, um, that's probably one of the easiest ways to disseminate information to people that need it. And you know that you're not going to go back and edit it, you're just going to let it live. So, and then if you want to even cover an additional base, there are programs that you can use which will allow you to multi-stream to places at the same time. So if you wanna take it even further so that you don't have to download the video and then upload it to another site, you can use a service like Restream.io, you can use a service like StreamYard which will allow you to um, do two multiple Facebook pages or a Facebook page and a, a YouTube or a Twitch or something like that. You can create one video and kind of just broadcast it out lots of different places. And then you can just go back to those places later like YouTube and just update the thumbnail and have it be something prettier to look at. But the biggest things are you don't have to edit it and you can answer people real time. And Great it's fast. Tip. I, I was actually curious about that multi-streaming for some projects that I'm working on. Um, for um, ease of use, 
Um, so you're, you've got somebody who is not tech savvy, which is the um, video editing program that each of you would recommend? If you're on a Mac, I would just go with iMovie because it's free and it's already built in. Um, if you find that even more intimidating than anything else, you can actually use Keynote um, or your PowerPoint presentation software. You can actually create an entire slideshow presentation and export that PowerPoint or um, the Keynote presentation as a video file. So if you were to do that, build in all the animations and kind of moving things, then you actually just go to the export and you can export the entire slideshow as a video and then you can upload that video to um, wherever. Yeah, you see, I don't know if you, I'm still sharing my screen, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, I was, didn't want to just do this for myself. But like if you're looking, this this is a PowerPoint. And when I hit export, it does say, like Shelly just said, create a video. And so if I want, you know, I can make, get a little more complicated here, but, you know, you can change how these things swoop in and you can sh you you can bring in an image of like the form that we're talking about or like a like a screenshot of like this is the website to visit and yes you can create multiple slides here you know and then move things around and then export it as a video and then like she said you got a video and that's powerpoint so i think there's so much that powerpoint and keynote can do other than just like listing bullet points um and I've used Keynote for years. I mean, all of those videos on, like I, we talked about earlier, on our YouTube channel, almost all of them are Keynote presentations, basically. These there ones. Was a, there was a question here, if staff wants to do Facebook Live um, on their account, uh, do they need to be given admin access um, to the page? Um, yes. And last I checked, that was definitely true. Yeah, whoever's the admin for your page sets the rules on who can go live on that page, if it has to be like a specific group of people or if anyone can go live. So you'll need to talk to your page administrator people to have them check what the settings are. And the other option is if you go live from your own Facebook account and then an admin then shares your video to the page, um, that's also another thing that they don't have to give you access, but they can share your video to the page. Yeah, there, um, there was a great point um, here that the um, the narration with PowerPoint um, is good. The um, animation um, stuff uh, definitely looks a little more polished and is often uh, very easy to pick up and learn. Those uh, The programs um, that Shelly mentioned um, are very user-friendly to pick up and learn. You do not need to be a techie. The editing side of this, um, like an hour or so, and you'll have it down on the basics. Um, we are into about our last three minutes here. Um, any any other questions? Um, there was definitely a comment here. Um, Powtoon is also very user friendly. Um, I'm going to get that out to the entire audience. Um, and in our kind of wrap up blog post, um, we will have um, some of the links um, to each of these different things that we talked about here today. Um, I'm, I'm going to take back presenter for a second as okay. um, I've got a few uh, quick announcements, um, but if there's any more questions, please definitely. Um, we've got another minute or two here. The Powtoon is like um, doodly and tunely, and the nice thing mm -hmm. is you do edit in their programs, but then you export a video file that you use in your own video editing. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question over uh, images. I think the the um, where to get images. I believe Shelly mentioned, what was it, Plex? Pexels. Okay. Well, there's several sites, um, but Pexels is one of them. So any of theirs, they're all commercial free and you can um, use those. Also, mm -hmm. when you do a Google search, you are able to um, sort by ones that are okay to be uh, reused and modified for commercial or whatever purposes. That is also in the advanced settings of Google image search. So you can um, look for royalty-free images online as well that way. Yep. Um, and the question slide that you're looking at here, um, the image came from Unsplash. Um, Unsplash is probably oh, yeah, my yeah. favorite for amazing looking, um, high quality. Uh, you're not required to credit them the way that I do in the corner, um, but 
I've actually gotten very positive feedback from artists when they see their stuff used and credited. It's a great way to build cred with the community. Oh, and Pixabay is another one too. Excellent, another another great site there. Um, to last uh, two announcements here, um, on lsmtap.org, um, on the front page, scroll down just slightly, there is an email list with about 800 community members um, that range from they're working on their first project um, to experts in the field. That email list is active every day and there's conversations. If you started to use any of these things and you needed help, uh, there are at least five or six experts in any tech-related legal services topic and the discussions on there are great. I think that covers all of our uh, questions at this point. Um, thank you so much, Shelley. Thank you so much, Daniel. It's wonderful having um, two great experts here to share with the community. Greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Sart, for setting this up. No problem.